the title page and Rochelle mask of the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. As Bacon himself tells us, every man of superior understanding in contact with inferiors wears a mask. Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence, talking about the Drochat engraving, said, There is no question, there can be no possible question, that in fact it is a cunningly drawn cryptographic picture showing two left arms and a mask. The Drochat engraving on the title page of the most famous secular work in English history is iconic and recognised the world over as the contemporary face of William Shakespeare, the greatest poet and dramatist of all time. In strikingly marked contrast, virtually nothing is known about Martin Drochat, the draftsman responsible for the most recognisable literary image since time immemorial. A remarkable level of secrecy still surrounds his private life, friends and the social and professional circles he moved in, even though he self-evidently knew some of the most important figures in Jacobean England and moved in the highest social circles of his time. This man, who for the first 33 years of his life lived in the heart of London, has scarcely left any documentary trace of his existence akin to him having been deliberately expunged from the records. To the present day, his whole life is completely shrouded in secrecy and mystery. The silence is deafening. What could be the reason for all this secrecy and silence? The key central reason is Martin Drochat and the famous, infamous Drochat engraving on the title page of the Shakespeare's first folio is a mask behind which its concealed author, Francis Bacon, is hidden in plain sight which when removed reveals the truth behind the Rosicrucian Freemasonic illusion and ludibrium that, lit that, literary, that the illiterate, semi-illiterate William Shakespeare was the author of the greatest literature in the history of the world. As Professor Schluter states, there is no archival evidence beyond his baptism that aligns him with a particular re religion nor is there any known record of an apprenticeship. Indeed, aside from his baptism and in an inferential reference to Michael's family in the 1617 Return of Aliens, there are no known records concerning him in Madrid, London or the Low Countries. He was 15 when Shakespeare of Stratford died in 1616, whom the Drochat engraving on the title page of the first folio is supposed to represent. The orthodox Shakespeare commissars have been at a loss how to plausibly explain that it was very unlikely that Drochat had met Shakespeare, who spent the last years of his life in Stratford. Mm. What good reason could there be for Drochat to have met Shakespeare before he was 15 years old, several years before he was commissioned to create the engraving for the Shakespeare First Folio, unless his considerable abilities include in being able to see into the future? To account for this awkward difficulty, it is often proposed by orthodox Shakespeare scholars that it was based on a portrait from the life, unfortunately or conveniently now lost. Drochat was around 20 years old when he was commissioned for the engraving which adorns the first folio. How he came by the commission has remained unknown to the present day. He was raised in walking distance of Bacon's great residential lodgings at Gray's Inn and Canterbury House in Islington where he presided over the oldest surviving Rosicrucian Freemasonic Lodge in the world. And, as we shall soon see, which is here revealed for the first time, Drochat was moving in Bacon's private secret circles around the time he was commissioned by Bacon for the engraving on the title page of the first folio. The apparent defects or anomalies of the Drochat engraving are only all too obvious. Not surprisingly, the controversial engraving has over the centuries come in for a great deal of severe criticism. It has a general lack of symmetry. The head is too large for the body, memorably described by Arthur Benson as the horrible hydrocephalus development of the skull. The effect of it is, is magnified by a too large head being placed on an absurdly small coat or doublet with oversized shoulder wings. 
When the great printmaker and portrait painter Gainsborough accepted a commission to paint a likeness of Shakespeare, he refused to consider the Drochart engraving. Damn the original picture, he said, a stupid a face I never saw. J.C. Squire called the engraving the pudding-faced effigy of Drochart, an image he said that depressed him when he contemplated it. In his ubiquitous life of William Shakespeare, which ushered in the 20th century, Sir Sidney Lee observes, The face is too long and the forehead high. The one ear which is visible is shapeless. The top of the head is bald, but the hair falls in abundance over the ears. A stiff and wide collar projecting horizontally conceals the neck. The dimensions of the head and the face are disproportionately large compared with those of the body. In the Stratfordian Bible, E.K. Chambers was also less than impressed. The head is too large for the body. The line of the jaw is hard. There is bad drawing in the hair, eyes, nose, ear and mouth, which is too much to the right. The lines of the dress are distorted. Samuel Schoenbaum was of a like mind. The Drochart showed defect, defects that are only all too gross. The huge head on a plate of rough surmounts a disproportionately small doublet. One eye is lower than the other. The hair does not balance at the sides. Light comes from several directions. It has long been known to Baconians that the Drochart engraving is a carefully constructed mask, one readily and easily demonstrable, a reality continually ignored by orthodox scholars because it is central to the enormous Stratfordian £1 billion a year fraud that Shakespeare wrote the Shakespeare works. In Bacon is Shakespeare, Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence observed, the back of the left arm, which does duty for the right arm, every tailor will admit that this is not and cannot be the front of the right arm, but is, without possibility of doubt, the back of the left arm. Professional confirmation of this was provided by an anonymous tailor writing in the Gentleman's Tailor, who, after noting that Sir Durning Lawrence had stated that Shakespeare was only a left-handed instrument used by Lord Bacon as a kind of shield or disguise for the authorship of the immortal plays and sonnets, remarked, It is passing strange that something like three centuries should have been allowed to elapse before the tailor's handiwork should have been appealed to in this particular manner. He then pointed out what is only all too apparent at a glance a fact ignored by orthodox scholars, some of whom were only too aware of its very obvious implications. The tunic, coat, or whatever the garment may have been called at the time, is so strangely illustrated that the right-hand side of the forepart is obviously the left-hand side of the back part, and so gives a harlequin appearance to the figure, which it is not unnatural to assume was intentional and done with express object and purpose. It is pretty safe to say that if a referendum of the trade was taken on the question whether the left side and the right side of the forepart represents the four parts of the same garment, the polling were given a unanimous vote in the negative. The above deficiencies are ascribed in ignorant, false and in some instances very deliberately fraudulent narratives by orthodox Shakespeare scholars to the incompetence of the engraver Martin Drochart. Yet the engraving exists in three states, indicating that its creator, Martin Drochart, worked very closely over a considerable period with the individuals responsible for the planning, preparing and publication of the Shakespeare First Folio. Confirming the process of its development was carefully watched over at every stage until it was consistent with how its prime movers in conjunction with its printers wanted it. As the printing of the volume proceeded, the engraving was deliberately altered on several occasions, as illustrated by its three surviving states, which all antedate the complete printing of the first folio. In his detailed study of the 79 first folios housed at the magnificent Folger Shakespeare Library, Professor Charlton Hinman point, points out some of the differences in the three known states. Regarding its elusive engraver, Martin Drochart, 
Modern authoritative orthodox Shakespeare scholars have conspired in a vast fraudulent conspiracy and deliberately lied to the world about his so-called incompetence to maintain the fiction and illusion that the illiterate, semi-illiterate William Shakespeare wrote the Shakespeare plays, exampled by the following. The early 20th century orthodox Shakespeare authority, Sir Sidney Lee, the Professor of English Language at the University of London, President of the English Association, Chairman of the Trustees of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and Editor of the Oxford Facsimile of the First Folio. The engraving was doubtless produced by Droshout just before the publication of the First Folio in 1623, when he had completed his 22nd year. It thus belongs to the outset of the engraver's professional career, in which he never achieved practice or reputation. In his still standard two-volume work, The Shakespeare Documents, that he dedicated to Henry Folger, founder of the Shakespeare Library, Professor B. Roland Lewis, Vice President of the International Shakespeare Society and Senior Member of the Modern Language Association of America, Martin Droshout's engraving of Shakespeare was probably one of his earliest endeavours and was produced when he was not yet of legal age. Later, he produced engravings of Fox, the, the, the martyrologist, of Richard Alton, of John Hansen, the Bishop of Durham, and of Lord Mountjoy Blunt. Others of his products were the Prophecies of the Sibyls, 12 in number, the fifth of which, Sibyl Samia, manifests the same lack of perspective that appears in his engraving of William Shakespeare, and Seasons, 4 in number. Virtually all of Droshout's work shows the same artistic defects. He was an engraver after the conventional manner and not a creative artist. The voluminous Samuel Schoenbaum, Distinguished Professor of Renaissance Studies at the University of Maryland, President of the Shakespeare Association of America, Vice President of the International Shakespeare Association and Trustee of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Even before being coarsened by touching up, the Droshout engraving shows defects that are all too gross and that can be ascribed only to the artist's ineptitude. The same stiffness, the same hard line would appear in his later portraits of distinguished men, Don, Fairfax, Villiers and the rest. The key elements of a fraud are very often simple and relatively easy to achieve and execute. The orthodox Shakespeare academic fraudster has numerous tools at their disposal. Firstly, just to simply take advantage of the trust of the naive, uncritical reader easily persuaded by an authoritative figure or so-called expert, with the accompanying title of professor whose works are issued by a prestigious university press. This in itself is usually sufficient. Or, alternatively, in the face of the irrefutable facts and evidence, the common response is simply a wall of silence, or a variant on the same theme, systematic suppression and omission. Then there is the method of ar arbitrary dismissal and distortion, not forgetting, of course, the downright lies and mendacity, all of it skillfully woven into their false, deceitful and fraudulent narratives. In the case of Sidney Lee, B. Roland Lewis and Samuel Schoenbaum, whose modus operandi include some or all of the above with regard to their misleading, false and fraudulent statements regarding Martin Droshout and his engraving for the title page of the Shakespeare First Folio, all that was required was for them to assuredly take advantage of the ignorance of their readers, the ordinary schoolman and the casual student, and simply not produce any other Droshout engravings. Unlike Sidney Lee, B. Roland Lewis and Sam Samuel Schoenbaum and countless other orthodox Shakespeare scholars who abuse the trust of their readers, we do not require the reader to take the matter on trust. Rather, unlike the above, we will here for the first time produce several engravings by Droshout, never before seen in a work on the Shakespeare First Folio, to expose and demolish this key element forming part of this gigantic Stratfordian fraud. First, however, instead of the false and fraudulent statements made by orthodox Shakespeare scholars, let us familiarise ourselves with the objective critical assessment by Professor June Schluter, the world authority on Martin Droshout and his engravings. 
Shakespeareans continue to puzzle over how a 22-year-old novice engraver could have been given the commission for the folio portrait and produced, in their judgment, so poor a result. But if it is an, an inferior work, its faults are anomalous. For Droshout's other engravings, which were done in London in the 1620s, also of public figures, show considerable expertise. In his recent article, English Broadsides 1, appearing in Print Quarterly, Malcolm Jones proposes that of the 11 portraits made by Droshout, listed in Hind, that one or two of them may well date from 1621 or 1622. Here are three examples of Droshout's work that predates the first folio. In the catalogue of prints and drawings in the British Museum, Frederick George Stevens provided an important and detailed description of the Dr. Panurgus engraving, which I have thought best to largely reproduce below. A representation of quackeries such as those which were alleged to have been practised against Robert Devereux, 3rd Earl of Essex, by Dr. Panurgus, Simon Foreman. The second subject is shown by means of the representation of a man like an effigy, which lies supine upon a table placed in the mouth of a furnace, and with its head subjected to the flames within, this figure which bears no particular likeness to the Earl of Essex. Some of the above is reproduced by Hind in engravings in the 16th and 17th centuries, with some additional information and commentary. He dates the engraving and the style of the costume at about 1620. Neither Frederick George Stevens, keeper of the prints and drawings at the British Museum, after repeatedly stating that the figure in the middle of the engraving did not resemble the Earl of Somerset, Hind, nor Professor Schluter or any other modern scholar has ever tried to determine the true identity of the figure in the middle of the engraving. This curious and suspicious silence has the feel of being something akin to the white elephant in the room, as the true identi identity of the figure in the middle of the Droshout engraving is immediately obvious, even at just a passing casual glance. It is very obviously Francis Bacon, and such was his way he has left us a series of clues and indications to confirm it. The whole engraving carries a series of monograms, anagrams and cipher evidence confirming the identity of Francis Bacon. The secret relationship between Bacon and Martin Droshout, the engraver of the Droshout engraving on the title page of the Shakespeare First Folio, has for obvious reasons been kept hidden and suppressed for the last 400 years. The figure of Bacon in the Dr. Panurgus engraving by Droshout, dating from around 1620 or the early 1620s, is drawn from the life, that points to Bacon sitting for it either at York House or Gorhambury. The complex engraving has clearly been very carefully planned and thought through, and must have involved Bacon giving Droshout instructions and further directions that over a period of time would have necessitated numerous revisions and amendments not unlike the Droshout on the first folio, which exists in three known states, showing close attention to detail, with significant as well as slight changes made to various aspects of the engraving. This process was all taking place around the time Bacon was planning and preparing his Shakespeare plays for the Jaggard Printing House, during the year 1621 to 1623 when it is likely, given that Bacon was forbidden from entering London, that Droshout made numerous visits to the Bacon family estate at Gorhambury, and at the time of its publication of the Shakespeare First Folio, Droshout may have been residing with Bacon and Ben Jonson at Gorhambury, as part of Bacon's entourage of good pens and other artists that made up his literary workshop.
The early engravings by Droeschout once and for all completely dispenses with the deceitful, false and fraudulent narratives of orthodox Shakespeare scholars that the so-called faults in the Droeschout engraving are the result of his lack of experience and artistic ability. For centuries, the Shakespeare Stratfordian authorities have misled and lied to the world about the one critical fact literally staring them in the face. The Droeschout engraving is very obviously and irrefutably a mask. The reason why they have repeatedly lied to the world and denied it is a mask is because it would at once in one single irrevocable stroke bring the whole Stratfordian fraud crashing down around them. Under the direction of Bacon, the Droeschout engraving adorning the Shakespeare first folio has been deliberately and skillfully executed as part of a Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic illusion and ludibrium, presenting the illiterate, semi-illiterate William Shakespeare of Stratford as the world's greatest poet and, drama and dramatist Shakespeare. Behind the Droeschout mask stands the true author of the Shakespeare works, Francis Bacon, who, through the instructions given to its engraver Martin Droeschout, secretly incorporated pictorial indicators, ciphers and various other cryptic devices into the mask and on the title page of the Shakespeare first folio, where it is so prominently placed, most or all of which, 400 years later, remain unknown to virtually the whole world. In his standard work, Portraits of Dante from Giotto to Raphael, a critical study with a concise iconography, the world authority on the subject, Professor Richard Thayer Holbrook, points out and illustrates that paintings, portraits and engravings of famous literary figures are not always what they seem, including the Droeschout mask engraving on the Shakespeare first folio. The less sceptical biographers of our most famous poet have wondered at the mask-like stiffness and false proportions of the Droeschout engraving, which B.J. so skillfully plays with in the folio of 1623. How, they ask, came our Shakespeare to have such a face? And why, ask others more sceptical, should this Droeschout engraving bear no resemblance to the original bust on thy Stratford monument, seen about 1636 by Sir William Dugdale, and reproduced in his History of the Antiquities of Warwickshire? For a good answer, see Mr W. S. Booth's illustrated pamphlet, The Droeschout Portrait of William Shakespeare, An Experiment in Identification, Boston, 1911. This work shows how the genesis of a portrait can be scientifically demonstrated. In the little-known work, The Droeschout Portrait of William Shakespeare, an experiment in identification with 31 illustrations, its author, William Stone Booth, by mechanically overlaying 27 sections of the Droeschout engraving with a contemporary portrait of Bacon by Simon van der Pass, confirmed the portraits are anatomically identical. To illustrate this, Stone Booth also made use of the 1640 Marshall engraving, based upon the engraving by Simon van der Pass, and the engraving by W. H. Worthington, based upon the portrait of Bacon by Van Soma in 1618, because it shows Bacon without a hat, which provides the opportunity to, opportunity to see his tall brow. The scientific approach illustrated that the Droeschout mask engraving on the title page of the Shakespeare first folio concealed and revealed its true author, Francis Bacon. Here are the three engravings of Bacon. The engraving of Bacon by Simon van der Pass, the 1640 Marshall engraving and the engraving by W. H. Worthington. And here are the first nine images of the Droeschout overlaid with the three engravings of Bacon. Followed by the next nine images of the Droeschout overlaid with the three engravings of Bacon. And here, finally, the last remarkable nine images of the Droeschout overlaid with the three engravings of Bacon.
The Shakespeare First Folio, the most famous secular book in the world, was entered on the Stationers' Register to Edward Blount and Isaac Jaggard on the 8th of November 1623. Just three weeks earlier, a somewhat less well-known work, written in Latin by Francis Bacon, was also entered on the Stationers' Register, which sit opposite each other as edited by E. A. Arbor. In Bacon's truly monumental De Augmentis Scientiarum, 1623, the title page contains 101 Roman letters and two words block italics. 101 plus 2 equals 103 Shakespeare in simple cipher. For the purpose of encipherment, the title page of the Shakespeare first folio is divided into two halves, above and below the Droshat engraving. The top half of the title page has 14 words containing 90, 90 letters. 90 plus 14 equals 104 minus one portrait equals 103, Shakespeare in simple cipher. Below the portrait are 29 italic letters, 6 block italic capitals and 32 Roman letters. 67, Francis in simple cipher. And if the 29 italic letters are added to the four digits in the date, it equals 33 Bacon in simple cipher. When the 32 Roman letters are added to the single engraving, again 33 Bacon in simple cipher. The whole page contains a total of 26 words, which plus the addition of the date and the single Drochat portrait equals 39 F Bacon in simple cipher. And moreover, the whole page has a total of 157 letters. 157 is Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher, the secret signature of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood. Beneath the Drochat mask, concealing its true author Francis Bacon, our hidden supreme poet and dramatist again cryptically signs the title page of the Shakespeare First Folio for those with eyes to see. If we take the date, 1623, which in simple cipher represents the letters A, F, B, C, which rearranged gives us the contraction of F, Bake, plus the last two letters from the word above it, London, O, N, we have F, Bacon. Talk about being hidden in plain sight.